but I can't, can't believe it. Ramadan is almost uh, rushing by. We've got a very special guest in studio. We'll introduce him later on. <laughs> and uh, in studio, uh, sitting in a slightly different position because... Uh, almost forgot about me. There are about three cameras on us here, so I have to really put on my best face today. <laughs> but uh, Saber, assalamu alaikum. Wa well, alaikum salam, how are you in Kashmir? I'm good, thank you. I'm getting a, a camera shy here. Wherever I look, there's a camera behind my ear. There's one in front of my nose. There's a side view. Almost like television. Almost like television. Oh. I hope the cameras can survive my face. <laughs> I've got a face for a radio, so... <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's fine. Of course, it's a Friday morning. Very exciting. Lots going on this morning. Absolutely, and we will introduce our special guest in a couple of moments. And uh, he's going to be with us for the next hour or so taking the trouble to fight his way through Cape Town's traffic to come all the way to Voice of the Cape. We're happy for that. Yes, very happy, very happy. Enjoying it. And indeed, uh, I'm quickly, I want to do some, uh, give us some weather mm. uh, for tomorrow. Uh, in fact, today, about 23 degrees. Saturday is going to be a warm one. Do watch out for that because when it gets warm this time of the year in Cape Town, the temperature on Monday plummets to 17 degrees Partly cloudy, possibility of rain, maybe some rain. Tuesday, completely overcast, and then rain on Thursday. So just be careful of that one. A sunset today, 5.48. It's getting earlier, and uh, sunrise getting later, 7.38 uh, at the moment. We're going to do some uh, marketing. We're going to do some ads, and then after that, we'll be right back with Ramadan AM. Which other radio stations have you guys been? Well, Jansen, Islam, Radio Islam, mm. Family Islam. Oh, okay, everywhere. <laughs> Basically. Radio. Oh, you must send my salams to um, uh, the Kari. Yeah. And also to Yakub as well. Uh. Mm. We just meet him yesterday. We arrived back from Mozambique. Oh, okay. We uh -huh. and he returned from Kenya. Okay. At the uh, same time, we yeah. just started on yeah. the airport yesterday. The meeting point was uh, Nando's. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> On the chicken. <laughs> An interesting thing in, in, in countries where Muslims are a confident minority, mm -hmm. in places like South Africa, a little bit in the, in, in, in the United Kingdom, mm. a, a lot of aid work. Yes, a lot oh, of aid yeah. organizations. This is the development of any community. Once you settle, become comfortable, you have a, a good civil liberty space. Yes. All trees will come up. Yeah. Now, only not only humanitarian organizations, there's advocacy organizations, there's politicians. Yeah. yeah. You see, right. because the easiest is humanitarian. Then you go from there to advocacy, to research, to, to all, all these sort of things. And welcome back to the Ramadan AM show with Shafiq and uh, Sabra. I'm now going to introduce our honorable guest. He's going to be with us uh, for the next hour. It is Dr. Hani El Banna. Now, um, if you don't know who he is, where have you been? He done so many things. How do I get through his CV? He uh, was brought up, he grew up in, uh, in Egypt, in Cairo. He qualified as a medical doctor. He also went to Al-Azhar for Islamic studies. So he's what you call a polymath. He's a full all-rounder. He can um, fix up your heart physically, exactly. psychologically, and all, all, all different aspects as well. And he can give you a meal after your open heart operation. <laughs> so he's a full all-rounder. He established Islamic Relief in 1984, but he left the organization in 2008 to do more things. He started the Muslim Charity Forum, the Muslim Hum Humanitarian Forum. He has visited nearly 100 countries, over 80 countries, um, and he moved to the United Kingdom in 1977. But also another thing, and he gets very shy about it, he's got an OBE, mm. the Order of the British Empire, so he's actually met the Queen, 
And uh, maybe in the next 10 years, we'll be talking to okay. Sir Dr. Hani <laughs> Albana, inshallah. <laughs> But uh, Dr. Hani Albana, if I carry on introducing you, there'll be a no-show. Mm. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salamu alaykum. I'm going to kick off with the first question, and then uh, Saibara will badger you with uh, further <laughs> questions <laughs> after <laughs> that. But, but first of all, um, I know I've asked this question before, but what motivated you to go into the arena of humanitarian work? Uh, in 1983, there was a big famine in Eritrea, in the part of Ethiopia. And it was very shocking, extremely shocking. We have not seen something like this in the last 50, 60 years, even more than the tsunami itself. And uh, it was hitting nations in the area. And uh, as a medical student, we, I, we felt in, uh, that we need to do something for the Muslim community because all the fund has been raised by good non-Muslim organization, but mm -hmm. there was no Muslim body at that time. So we sat down with my colleague and we decided to go around and raise some fund. We raised the fund first, then we registered the organization afterwards. So we did not structure properly the work by actually registering organization, the raising fund, because the needs were more than actually what we expected at that mm -hmm. time. Just before Sabra asked the question, so we, we always learn by our mistakes. That's right, yeah, yeah. And just another sort of footnote, he, um, Dr. Hani Albana is the guest of Al Imdad mm -hmm. Foundation. Yeah. And I've had the privilege of, of working with Al Imdad. Uh -huh. I went to Pakistan with them a number of years ago. And uh, like most of these organizations, they're doing absolutely sterling work. Brilliant indeed. Now, of course, you know, Doc, just to understand, back in 1984, at that point in time, like you mentioned, the famine in Ethiopia was the inspiration behind creating this particular NGO. So just to clarify, at that point in time, were there any other Muslim NGOs, or was this initially the very first one? In Europe, as a humanitarian, no. In America, there might have been one organization called Human uh, Concern International, was working in Afghanistan uh, at that time, but not in Europe at all. And uh, so, we, but all the mosques mm -hmm. and the individuals and businessmen were actually raising fund and giving to other organizations. That's oh, okay. why we need to bring this platform yes. on, 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 on the scene. And at that point in time, what was the vision for the organization? To be very honest, mm -hmm. no vision. Ah. You see, it was just respond ding, to the needs of the people. Our little slogan at that time, help, 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 help. Uh, because we did not, we were not mature at that time to think about strategy, to think about vision, to think about whatever it is. But later on, five years after that, we started to have a vision mm -hmm. to spread globally. Of course, you know, how was this received by the community within the UK as well as we've seen Islamic relief now worldwide? Honestly, because we were not Asian at that time, we have a suspicion eye mm -hmm. because most of the community or the majority or of the community, more than 90% are Asian, but we managed to swim against the tsunami waves of this suspicion uh, of, mm -hmm. of uh, the, uh, the cultural background and they started to trust us after three years. Because we started to raise the penny and the pound. We did not go for the big sharks at the very beginning. We used to go from mosque to mosque, from street to street, from shop to shop, to distribute leaflets. During the week, actually, I used to leave my medical school and go outside to distribute leaflets, even to houses. That's why they used to see me. And we started something called caravan tour. During the month of Ramadan, we used to take a car and to tour the whole country. By every day in a different city and go to different mosques distribute leaflets, stay in the mosque, talk to the people. So the Asian community started to see us physically, so they started to trust us. How important is it that the community sees you physically? Um, at the radio station, we deal with a lot of uh, humanitarian mm. organizations, yeah. and a vital element yeah. is, let's put it be blunt, is marketing. Yeah. But I'm sure you'll agree that your marketing has to be different to a commercial company. We have to be humble. Yeah. Um, and, and we have to be really clear as to what our goals are. So how did you manage to, to learn about actually having to market an NGO? To be with the people, being with the people in the field will drive you and will raise your spirit high and will motivate you and will let you to have the word from your heart. Talking about some images and photographs and reports like anybody reading any, any poetry, whatever it is, but actually, 
the more you mix with people, the more you understand the depth of their problem, the more you'll be able to penetrate the hearts of the listener or the viewers because you are throwing your message deeply into their hearts. Did you find that for yourself it was a process of, of education? Um, because aid work is all about knowing people, isn't yeah. it? It's about being able to look at a person and quietly assess that person is sick, that person is, and I know you can do that. You can look at a person, you can say almost what kind of aid they might need when you get that experience, especially when you're in a crisis situation. Yes, it, it's a combination of both. You see, for, if I give an example of how did you make the needs assessment for Chechnya in 1999, uh, it was against the regulation of the British government of going to this area. Mm -hmm. So they even don't go to Moscow. But by the time the foreign office came to advise us, I was already there, not only in Moscow, I was already there in Grozny. And I was with the country representative at that time, looking at every aspect of life of the people. We started with $10,000, which was a token, then went up to $100,000 after two or three days. Then by the time that we finished the assessment, it was $1 million as a budget to start because we needed trucks, we needed vans, we needed... Uh, clinics, we needed tents, three layers tent, and all these sorts of things came when you sit down with the people. If you remember in this, at that time, there's something called Sputnik camp. Mm -hmm. Sputnik camp, which is a train camp. The family in, lives in one compartment on the two, uh, on, on the shelf where you put the, the bags, then on the seats, then on the floor. For, for, for an in a sub zero temperature, maybe minus 10, minus 15, minus 20. And with, with being with the people there, you manage to know what they need exactly medically, uh, psychologically, uh, uh, the shelter that they want, the water that they want, or everything. And uh, before Sabra asks another question, um, do you think one of the most important things in humanitarian work is getting to the people first, not coming with a lot of goods? that might not be needed. I can remember in the, during the tsunami, certain people from Europe sending winter clothing to uh, Aceh. And that's useless, isn't it? <laughs> you know, that, that basically you, you have to get on the ground and know exactly what people need and even buy local goods and local food. Yes, sir. Buying local goods and local food is very good for the local economy. This is something for all the humanitarian organization has to do. Stop sending cans and bags of rice from South Africa in a very long journey, for about 5,000 miles, 10,000 miles, extremely expensive. It's very emotional to see you bringing two sacks of rice or whatever it is. No, it is for myself because I'm a social, uh, what do you call it? So social mufti, not religious mufti. In my social ifta, I say this haram because it, it, it uh, drains money, resources, and effort, and it goes there by actually after six or eight weeks. This number one. Number two, actually, being first there, that does not have to become very arrogant, to be first where the problem is happening and to anticipate the problem. Like, actually, before the Bosnian conflict came, we were, promo we were actually advocating for this something will be happening because now the, the greater Yugoslavia is, is, is divided and there's a Muslim minority in the area and there'll be a conflict. This was one year before that. And we start to make the connect, uh, contact and the connection with the local representative in Sarajevo as well as in Zagreb. And by the time the conflict came in April 12, 1992, we were on the ground. But we were on the ground because we get educated about what's happening there from the local community. Now, of course, Doc, you know, financials can tend to become a bone of contention within aid organizations. With your expertise and your experience, how have you ensured accountability when it came to issues of the financials of these? Accountability is a killer. If you don't use it, it kills you. Finance is what destroys the organization if you are, don't have a good team at that time. To have resources or not have resources was not on my agenda or not our agenda at that time. Why? Because we were focusing on the aim of the work itself. The aim is to get the people, the, 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 the material that they need at that time. So what we have been doing, it were focusing, I can give the example of Chechnya. We started with less than $10,000, but after three months of taking the risk, being there, in this very difficult time, we spend after three months about two or three million dollars. So because people found you on the ground, because people found that you are sincere, because people found that actually you are delivering. 
So this $10,000 grown up from 10 to spending, not actually to raising, uh, to spending $3 million in less than three or four months. This is how finance is, is, can come to you, even if you don't have the resources. But my advice now to most of the organization nowadays, because now we are governed by security, we are governed by intelligence, not by humanitarian workers in any conflict zone. Be careful, extremely careful not to send an amateur. Be careful if you don't know the mechanics of working in conflict zones like in, in Yemen or in Syria or in South Sudan. You go there and take some photographs and by mistake you do something there, you will be classified. Because this area is very well, in, uh, 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 very well infested or be, there's many, many, many secret agencies from different backgrounds. If you go to Syria area now, there are secret agencies from different European countries, from different Arab countries, from uh, Iran, and everybody is watching without telling you that you are watching. Mm -hmm. And some of them will be writing a report about you. If you take by mistake a photograph next to somebody who has been classified, if you go to Somalia, the same. If you go to South Sudan, if, if you go to Boko Haram, Nigeria, Boko Haram, same. If you go to all this kind of area, well, actually, there's many, many, many secret services are there to watch over any humanitarian work. So not for the amateur, please, not for the amateurs, not for the, even the, the so-called organization was saying that they are actually delivering. They have to learn the art of how to deal with security and with secret service. And uh, our special guest, Dr. Hani al -Banna, um, <clears throat> known as the founder of Islamic Relief, but of course in South Africa right now he's uh, a guest of Alim Dad, and he does a lot of consultancy work nowadays. We're going to go to the marketplace, and after that we'll be back with our special guest, Dr. Hani Albana. Of course, before the ads, later on in the show, if you've got uh, questions you'd like to ask the good doctor, 0722380712. I'm glad you're but talking about that, that, that security thing. Yeah, because it's because, killer. Um, uh, I saw people being captured in Libya because they were stupid. Yeah. <laughs> um, Somalia yeah. as well. I don't know why people, they think they can just go in and then mm -hmm. it's crazy, isn't it? Either they captured in or they captured they come back. Taking a quick look at your Most traffic. of the now American, uh, when they North come back to America, American, we the stopped in the airport for hours. Traffic towards the N3 highway. N3 inbound, there's congestion That's happening problem, there. Yeah. Slow yeah. moving traffic towards Hospital Bend. And finally, Edgemead N7 northbound. Slow moving traffic towards the Bosman's Gum Road exit. Your next traffic update just before 8. Where is it in that? Uh, IT. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is uh, in, in, uh, in what they call it in... Uh... In fact, what happened in Syria, there was some grouping in South Africa that took some aid to Syria, and I, yeah. I got very angry, and I warned him, and they were giving the hand, aid straight into the hands of Jabhat al Nusra. SubhanAllah. They don't know what's the difference. And then the one guy got killed. In, from they Britain as well. Listen. They yeah. don't want to listen. They must do it themselves. I said, yeah. go to the established organizations yeah. who've got the people on the ground. Yeah. Unfortunately. Oh, yeah. There was yeah. on Facebook. Oh, okay. Just watch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> even even at that time, 2011, 2012, the caravan corridor from UK was said, "Don't send caravan. Don't send caravan. Please, for God's sake." Exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. But people don't listen to you because even sometimes in the fiqh, hand in hand. Okay, hand in hand where you are in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But now there's wiring. See, why, how can you help uh, Rohingya people? Hand in hand? You, you can send the money to a credible organization in Bangladesh or somebody here, and it will be wired to the people. Even some in certain uh, countries or certain like, like Gaza, actually, we, we, we transfer the money directly to the donor, mm -hmm. to, to, not to the donor, to uh, the, the, the recipient mm -hmm. uh, in, in the area because of this kind of money laundering and in these in this conflict zones. Even so, in an area like Gaza, you have to be very careful because one day one of the recipients might become uh, killed by the Israeli and they killed. You are telling, you are giving the money to somebody who was actually fighting us. He was a terrorist, and this is the classification of a different country. So you have to be extremely careful of choosing the people that you actually support. Not only that, of how to send the money to them. 
cash becomes a big liability yeah. when you give cash in hand in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Big liability. But you can roast me. I can become roasted chicken or fried or grilled chicken. <laughs> and I can be tasty. <laughs> Since we had um, Nando's yesterday oh, yeah, for Nando's iftari. Nando's for iftari. <laughs> <laughs> so are you a griller or roaster? <laughs> Fryer. <laughs> Fryer. Oh, very that's You remind? No, no. Uh, you remind me of uh, the, the lady who was uh, the, the one who combed the... Uh, the hair of the daughter of uh, Pharaoh. She was a believer in Moses. Oh, okay. And when she discovered that, you know what they, tell her, they did to her? They told her either you come back to lordship of Pharaoh, which is Egyptian, of course, you know, or we'll boil the oil and we'll throw the five children of yours into Jeez. the boil. It's a true story. She said, I'm not going to go back to your religion. One by one in front of her, till they came to the youngest baby and she was watching her children. And the next baby spoke to her, Mommy, don't be afraid. The fire and the day of judgment is more heavier than that. And she, the only request she told to, to her, what? Uh, she said, can I request you for something? She said, what? Yes, okay. And she told him, when you kill me, please bury me with my children. Collect all our bones together. That's why when the Prophet ﷺ went in Isra and Mi'raj, he smelled this very beautiful smell. In heaven, I said, "What is this, Jibril? Hazrat Jibril?" He said, "This is this, this is uh, the the hair hairdresser or hair co- co- was combing the the hair of the daughter of Pharaoh. Oh. So he was smelling. Oh. She as a martyr. Yes. She, she yes. see all the five children being boiled or grilled or whatever or uh, fried. Mm. Unfortunately, oh, you cannot imagine that. But the, in the good old, in the bad old days, mm. this was happening, unfortunately, especially with the Egyptian. Mm. So be careful with the Egyptian. Don't marry Egyptian, <laughs> <laughs> whether male or female. <laughs> the female can slice you <laughs> when you are having, enjoying your sleep. <laughs> I don't know what the male will do. We'll do the same. <laughs> We're just going through some adverts. We have a lot of adverts in Ramadan. Yes, yes, yes. All food adverts. <laughs> <laughs> the months of fasting advertise for food. The richest table in the year, Ramadan. Yeah. Good to see that you have come with these adverts. That means that you are kicking in the live. <laughs> and people want to advertise. Yeah. Now they a drink being advertised, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going back now. And welcome back to the Ramadan AM show, live with uh, Sabra and uh, Shafiq. Our special guest, Dr. Hani Albana, OBE, Order of the British Empire, for his services uh, to humanitarian work over the decades. Everybody says uh, talks associated with Islamic Relief. Yes, he did found the organization, but he left it in 2008. And since then, he's been doing a lot of um, consultancy work. He's founded the Muslim Charity Forum, the Muslim Humanitarian Forum, uh, he still visits uh, all parts of the world. He's currently a guest of Al Imdad and has recently returned from Mozambique. Uh, Dr. Albana, just before the break, you were talking about the great need for security of humanitarian organization. And I did say off air, and it was live on Facebook, that they, they, a lot of people make a big mistake when it comes to this. They think they can go in themselves mm. um, when the best thing is to work with accredited organizations because in 
conflict zones, and I've been there myself, and you spoke about spies. I can remember being in a hotel in Benghazi in Libya 2011. There were more spies in the hotel than there were, <laughs> there were, the, there were, there were us. It was quite ridiculous, actually. Yeah. That just quickly, just sort of your word of warning in terms of that, how careful a person must be. Send your money to accredited organizations who've got people on the ground, who've got the right channels, and who've got the right uh, relationships with government, whoever the people might be. See, it is to do, to do with ego. The ego of myself that I have to be there. This has nothing to do with the religion. Mm -hmm. the religion has to tell you trust people. Even in the fiqh theology, okay, giving cash hand in hand is one thing, but actually finding the best way and the fastest way and the safest way to, res to, to send your fund through this credible organization. If you don't know the mechanics of the area, you don't have an organization which understands the mechanics of the area, you could lose your life or you could end being in a jail because some of those secret agencies in this area will look at you through their eyes, not through your emotion. And the more you become emotional, the more they become excited to classify you and put your name on the list. To tell you something, there's something called Thomson Reuters or World Check. You know how many, how, many, how, many, how many names on the terrorist list on this organization? Three million. Most of them, if not all of them, are Muslims. Wow. Because what they see you talking about was sometimes they uh, look at the media and write a report uh, and read a report about you. They just say that this man is saying this without you knowing it. So I am telling my people, I'm telling everyone, something like Thomson Reuters is one, but there's many of it. Each country has got its own list according to the criteria that they put for actually extremism, radicalism, and terrorism. So be careful, please. Be careful, please, not to jump on a bandwagon, getting excited by your ego. Just very quickly before cyber uh, um, grows you like a chicken. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sure if we use Arab, Arabic word, wasatiya, we have wasatiya. to go, go down the middle. Yeah, middle, yeah, middle way, yeah. Now, of course, you know, over the years, what have been some of the challenges that you have noticed within aid organizations? Most important challenge is human resources, <coughs> not financial resources. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get excited by getting the very emotionally excited individual to do the job without understanding <coughs> the mechanics and the dimension of the, of the jobs. As you were talking about, the, the philosophy of working in, in the conflict zones, different to a family stricken <coughs> area, then different to a poverty area. So all these have got different parameters and dimensions and access to the people there. Then the culture, the culture, the, the local culture. You have to be governed in this area by the local culture of the people, not by imposing your local culture on them. This is something which created a lot of conflict. In the, in the case of Darfur, actually some of the Western, coming from the young people working for big international uh, global organization, mm -hmm. they were looking down at the sultan yeah. or at the uh, tribe uh, chief, and they were not talking to him. Because what? Because he's wearing a very old clothes with a slipper and said, no, no, I'm going to have the access. And they didn't have an access. So they have to come back to this miserably looking old man wearing a slipper and tell him, please, sir, give us the access. Without knowing the culture, you get nowhere. It's interesting. Um, I'm going to put a, an observation to you, something that I experienced from the, from the people of Somalia. Um, when we were about to leave, a lot of them were very sad, and we asked, why, why are you so sad? They said, you know, you South Africans came here, and you were the first people from an NGO that actually hugged us, I see. shook our hands, That's it. Um, and actually didn't treat us as objects. How important is it to truly have, I think, shafaka with, with people? And sometimes it means shaking a person's hand, sometimes it means embracing a person, whether they, as you say, might be wearing dirty slippers or whatever the case may yeah. be. To be very honest, you are their servants. Because the money you have from South Africa, it is their money. It bought your ticket, it bought your hotel uh, room, it bought your food. So we have to look at them as our masters. Unfortunately, nowadays, we look at them as, I don't like to say slave, but as, as somebody, objects. So don't ever, never in your life or in my life to treat them as numbers, as a pair of shoes as number of tents, as, 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 as food boxes. They are human beings, they have dreams, aspiration, and they want to live the best life, and you are, even if you are a donor, even if you are a millionaire. Once Allah said, 
وفي أمواليهم حق معلوم للسائر والمنحون they have God given right on your money once there's money for them in your account it is theirs not you even as a millionaire so you don't uh, you don't dictate what to do with the money just give them the money give them the money no because actually this is their money so don't feel pity for them don't actually look down on them even you be having the character uh, the, the normal character of the human being towards another human being as a family member absolutely um, Doc, of course, over the years, you know, we've seen various organizations now literally mushroom all across the globe. Yeah. What has been your observation in terms of, obviously, there's progression that's been made since 1984, but in general, what has been your observation with regards to aid organizations that have come about, not only in South Africa or the UK, but globally as well? Let Are me, we headed in the right direction? Yeah, let me take you for a, for a journey. When we started, our Islamic was very small and there was against anybody else to come. And my wife was hammering me, saying, what resources do you have? You don't have any resources. Nowadays, I welcome new organization, but with regulation, with accountability, with a standard. Some people nowadays, because, to be very honest, took it as business. Some people took it as a glamour. You see, this is fame. Let us have an organization. Some of the organization being established somewhere without mentioning the countries, Two, three businessmen sat down and said, let, let us do some, uh, create more business and give us this status in, 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 uh, in the community. This is extremely difficult to deal with somebody like this, but we cannot stop them. But w if, if you would like to deal with this problem, you have to put standard. It's the, 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 the country of South Africa has to put a standard, humanitarian standard, to be followed by such an organization. They have to put a strong regulation at how to raise the fund how to spend the fund, where the fund will go. Actually, to train the, the, the staff, spend money on training of the staff, not getting a staff who do not know what to do, and actually send them to go to these difficult areas within Africa or Asia or in conflict zones. So this kind of capacity building, training, research, advocacy, and getting the right people, raise the awareness level in the community itself about humanitarian work and the humanitarian work and the humanitarian response becomes like an art not only an art, a profession which produces the art of delivery, the art of being with the people, that, as you said, being with the people, smiling at their face, shaking their hands, sitting down with them, and letting them to feel that you are one of them. This is an art, an art of belief inside your heart. So really, the material work now become a profession and become an art and become something like a career, like medicine, like agriculture, like engineering, like economy, like uh, politics, all these sort of things. Dr. Ohani Abana, one thing that is uh, very beautiful that I've seen in, in the humanitarian field, I'm sure you'll agree, that number one, <clears throat> we might be Muslim of faith and identity, but humanitarian that work is for everybody, isn't it? It's for all human beings. And on, on another level, cooperating with other organizations to make the delivery even more efficient. I mean, I've seen Islamic Relief, Alim Dad, Give to the Givers, Muslim Hands, all the other organizations, Sabi National Zakar Fund, working hand in hand with other organizations to provide a better service for those who need it. Your, your comment on that? Partnership, coordination, communication is not a necessity. It is a duty and it's a must. Never think that because you have 100 million or 200 million, 500 million, you can do it alone. It's strong, it's fatal. In certain areas, you have to work, first of all, with partner organization in your own country, partner with the, with the governments, partnership with even the local community itself. The organization who thinks that actually they can do it alone, they are actually uh, uh, do, no, not doing any justice for them. That's, and when I can give an example, in Europe, this kind of partnership is on the scene all the time. And in spite of the fact there's something called SCHR, it's an, 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 an umbrella platform getting 12 or 13 organizations together, like Oxfam, Save the Children, World Vision, and others. Those organizations, each one of them, the budget of each one of them is 1 billion or 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion. Why do they sit down together? They don't need. They have the finance, they have the history, they have the constituency, but they sit down to coordinate. They sit down to cooperate and they sit down to plan for the future of the humanitarian sector globally. So we as Muslims must, must, and the one who does not believe in partnership, he or she are killing herself. The ego in our heart has to be killed. And this actually, the ego is 
the one who shaped the religion, not the one who shaped the deen. Absolutely. <clears throat> On that note, we're going to go for a quick break. Our special guest, Dr. Hane Albana, OBE, um, founder of Islamic Relief Worldwide. But of course, he now does a lot of uh, consultancy work. He's in South Africa with Al Imdad. And uh, after the break, uh, we'll also uh, find out the kind of work that he's doing with Al Imdad. He just recently re returned from Mozambique. Time goes so quickly when it's a deal. Have you written a book about your life at all? I wrote one or two books, but have not been published yet. But I have a small book. I've been written and published yeah, 60 pages or 70 pages. No, that's too uh, short. This was actually was made to be for the uh, school. Yes, for school, yeah. yeah. And uh, even I'm going to talk to one of the schools in near Leeds in the in, in, in UK next month about uh, the book and about my journey. This, one of our dreams nowadays is to bring these umbrellas, to bring people together. Yes. That's why actually you mentioned Muslim Shahs Forum, you mentioned Humanitarian Forum. Muslim Shahs Forum is an umbrella which bringing Muslim charities in UK together. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. It's very difficult. I know, I know. I'm telling you, it's very difficult. Yeah. Okay. The second one is for the global, which is the humanitarian forum, mm. which you find yourself that you are working in this global atmosphere, trying to change the atmosphere. You can imagine if you have a, tree, a seed you can put in the land yeah. to become a tree. But if you want to change the climate, it is more difficult. Yeah. That's why actually it's happening. But it takes a lot of time. And to be very honest, we as Muslims do not invest in research do not invest in advocacy, do not invest in building a think tank groups and institutions. We invest in handout. Ramadan is the month of the handout strong. Ramadan should be the month of building capacity and building community. But unfortunately, we're still traditional. Very true. In fact, in countries like South Africa, the United States, the United Kingdom, we should already have institutions and we don't have them. Yeah, and actually when, when you look at that, your attachment or your history with UK and with USA, you should have this coming to us. But sometimes people interpret the religion differently. Yes. You see, yeah. classically. Yeah. Yes, if the Prophet ﷺ was in the 21st century, he would not have done it the same that he was. The principle would be the same. The core message would be the same. But the delivery would be different. The application is different. The application yeah. would be different. Or even with discussing the code of dress of Muslims, especially Muslim men. If the Prophet ﷺ was born in London, so what his code of dress could have been? <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back to Ramadan AM. Our special guest uh, in studio is uh, Dr. Hani al Abana, and uh, he is, was the founder of Islamic Relief. Of course, he's left Islamic Relief in 2008. He was awarded the OB, Order of the British Empire, he started the Muslim Charity Forum that uh, gets uh, charitable organizations under one umbrella in the United Kingdom, Muslim Charities, and the Muslim Humanitarian Forum, which works in the global context. Dr. Albana, there's a question has come via the WhatsApp line. It says, one of the things we see being debated these days is the issue of what they call poverty pornography. In other words, uh, it's a picture, people use a picture of a starving baby to raise funds. Mm. Does poverty porn address the real structural problem of poverty? Don't ever abuse the needs of the needy. It's criminal. It's criminal. Mm. It's criminal. And in my opinion, as a social mufti, social mufti, not religious mufti, right. it's haram. All right, another fatwa. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm getting <laughs> quite unquote, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, because what? Because this is, uh, it is their rights the right of the people to tell you take a photograph or not before you, t b b before you take the photograph without their consent. They have to give you the consent. Mm -hmm. They have to be a policy of how to take the photograph, mm -hmm. how to film, mm -hmm. and how to other, by asking the people, please, will you allow me to take a photograph of you or not? If they said yes, you do it. But actually, this, this kind of heavy word, uh, poverty pornography, it is absolutely ridiculous. It should, it's not humane. It's degrading, not degrading the people who are in the photo, but the people who took the photo. 
You see, the, their morale is down and they are not doing any justice for the people who they pay their salary. Having said that, you know, how important is it for media that go into these regions to report on these cases? How important is it for them to be familiar and to understand how to report when it comes to crises like this? As I said, you have to have a policy of filming and taking the photographs of the big disaster area. And you have to be with the people in this area and asking them and telling them, shall you permit us to take your photograph or not? Mm -hmm. See, I tell you something which I have to confess publicly because I'm not a saint or I'm not an uh, angel. One day in 1993, 1994, when I was in Albania, I did this kind of uh, poverty, whatever you call it, mm. by giving the money mm. hand in hand to the Grand Sheikh of Albania. Now I regret this image. It's very bad for me to be seen that I'm giving this few hundred dollars to the Grand Sheikh. It's his money. Why should I degrade him? To be very honest, if I look at this photograph again, after 30 years, I am the one who has been degrading myself. Interesting indeed. Um, Dr. Albana, tell us about the work you've been doing with Alim Dad. Um, you are, are the guest in South Africa. You've just returned from Mozambique, which, as we all know, was um, hit by a very, very severe flood. So tell us something about that aspect of what you're doing in South Africa. So Al Amdad is a member of the Muslim Child's Forum in UK, mm -hmm. which is actually established as more, more than 10, 11 years ago. And uh, I am here as, 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 as the chairman of this organization and supporting one of the member organizations of Muslim Child's Forum. This is to start with. I'm promoting it as well. What we have seen of distributing the rebuilding packs is more important for me but the, but, uh, than actually giving the, the food parcel. Actually, in these two countries, which is uh, Malawi and uh, Mozambique, actually we were doing both, giving the, the food, for food parcel to the needy as well as giving this kind of actually rebuilding materials to rebuild their houses. And we went together to see how, how badly this area in Buzi, Buzi, Buzi in, in, in uh, Mozambique, where the river came, it was more than two and a half meters height uh, on, on the same uh, city. So for at least one week, the people were staying on the top of the, of the roof of the mosque. Even the imam was telling me, for more than 500 people were on the mosque, on the top, on, on the roof there. No food. No water, no prayer. He was saying that we were all making tasbih. And every now and then, it was raining, 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 raining. And even the whole city of uh, Bayra was un was, was, did not have electricity for more than four weeks. So you can imagine how difficult it is. And in that, alhamdulillah, as well as other organizations supporting in this, like Muslim Aid Australia, Islamic Relief and others, were actually there to help from the very beginning. Even actually, they, the people knew their faces because they came to this very difficult area. Even two of our workers from different organizations lost their life. When they were coming back, they have a kind of accident. One of them, alhamdulillah, was saved, but another two uh, were killed. They came from UK as well. So those people who started to work in this area believed that the humanitarian work is a mission. Mm. And actually, they have to be there no matter if they lose their life, if they have a broken leg or other, because they have to be next, as you exactly said, next to the people at the time that the people need to be to, to see to, to to see them coming to to, to be with them and then that was doing this as well as other organization alhamdulillah i, I salute them and before sabra asks the final question I'm, i want to talk to you about uh, a griller or, or a roaster <laughs> yeah she's going to sort of uh, peri peri <laughs> the question of, of impact um, yeah. a lot of people say yeah but how can you make a difference and i believe in the, the starfish theory when there's a little boy mm on the beach and there's millions of starfish and he's throwing them into the sea and an old man says but you're not making a difference and a little boy says it makes a difference to that one starfish that's right do you agree in that theory i do agree with that and this is extremely valuable now that to measure the impact of your work it costs money that's why organization does not do it but actually if i educate my donor that amongst my work as a humanitarian organization i need to take something for research to take something for advocacy to take something for actually uh, uh, measuring the impact. Because how on earth I would understand that by distributing this 10 tons or 5 tons or 100 tons of aid material had an impact on the life of people there at the time of difficulty. 
How on earth, the, when, I, when, when I build the water tank on the top of the mountain, this will have an impact? You measure the impact of the water tank uh, on, on, on the mountain by, uh, by calculating the number of children who went to school of, because this, those children used to come down from the top of the mountain to the valley to bring the water. But by bringing the water to the top of the mountain, you actually save their time and their effort to do it to the good school. So you have to measure the impact as a process of building your project. And before Sabara asks you the last question, flavor of Perry Perry, um, somebody says, uh, 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 Assalamu alaikum, Shu, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rab, who is the speaking? The person speaking is Dr. Hani Al Banna. He was the founding, uh, uh, the founder of Islamic Relief. He's left Islamic Relief in 2008 to do even greater work. He's founded the Muslim Charity Forum, which is an umbrella body for uh, Muslim charities in the United Kingdom. Muslim Humanitarian Forum, which works on a global scale, and he's currently visiting South Africa, a guest of Alim Dad. Alim, Alim Dad have got offices around the world. The one office is in the UK, and that's part of his UK brief, visiting Mozambique. And of course, Dr. Hani Albana has got decades of experience in the humanitarian field. Always lovely to listen to him. Okay, Sabara, over to you. <laughs> Final question this morning. Um, Doc, I'd like to know, Having, you know, online seen various aid organizations, and I speak from within the UK, uh, in terms of marketing their brands, we've seen them evolve in a sense that it's almost become very glamorous to be associated with an aid organization. I won't take names, um, but it looks like to be the in thing. You want to be with these organizations because you'll get to meet the who's who's, rub shoulders with, you know, the rich and the famous. Is, is this the method that we're now seeing being used? I see South Africa slowly seems to be following suit, but very slowly. But more in the UK, I see some of the new organizations taking on a very different method when it comes to putting out their brands. Some, there's a fine line between, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, media publicity mm. and between going over or off, off, offline. Some of the young organization go offline most of the time because they don't have the history, they don't have the mechanics yet, and they are so scared if they don't overdo it, mm. they will not get the fund. They don't understand that actually you get the fund if you focus on the issue. That's why if you remember maybe half an hour ago, as I told you, when we started, we did not worry about the fund. We were just going help, 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 and people give us the money. At the time of Chechnya, as I give the other, other, other example, actually we started with $10,000, but within three to four months, we spent more than $3 million. At the time of going to South Sudan, with no fund, actually, we managed to get fund from UN because uh, agencies, because we went to area, nobody else was going to visit us. So media is good, but could be a killer. What you have to uh, uh, build your credibility, build your integrity, and build your character as an organization by being next to the people, not overdoing it, by overdoing uh, having excessive photography or excessive filming of the poor people to show them, to show the world how, how, how pity you are for them. Mm -hmm. This might be short-lived, but will not, will not stay for a long time because mm -hmm. now you are complaining about it. The more we complain, the more we, the, our organization will go down the drain. Mm -hmm. I see there's one more question that's come through, you know, in terms of just understanding. It's been 35 years that you've been, you know, in this type of work. What has been the greatest lesson that you've learned? Uh, to be very honest, the greatest lesson to learn, I would love to be with the people all the time. That's why every now and then I travel. I become rusty when I sit in UK. Uh. I become very, what do you call it, uh, miserable when I sit in UK. I polish myself, alhamdulillah, when somebody like Imdad Ali take me to the field to clean my heart and to clean my mind and give me the strength. Now I become more energy, I'll fight back. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, just uh, bearing in mind that Dr. Hani Albanna is the oldest person sitting in the studio here. Uh, I, I, I'm the youngest one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> but Dr. Hani Albanna, shukran for visiting yeah. us, for taking the trouble Thank uh, you. After Suhoor, to come all the way to the Shalom. studios live. It's always Shalom. a pleasure to chat to you. Shukran very much. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. Ramadan Karim.